Hope for Israel begins with God promising to raise up a new David, a future messianic king who's going to be the kind of leader that Israel needed but never got. And this new Israel who's going to come under the messianic king's rule is going to be a transformed people. God's going to deal with the heart of their problem of rebellion by giving them new hearts. It's just like Moses promised at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. God says he's going to remove their hard hearts and send his spirit into his people to give them new soft hearts that can love and obey their God. And this idea gets developed in the next strange vision. Ezekiel sees a huge valley filled up with dry human bones and skeletons. And God tells him that it's an image, a metaphor for Israel's spirit state. So their rebellion against God, it resulted in exile and the literal death of many people, but it was also a metaphorical death of their covenant relationship. And God tells Ezekiel that his spirit is coming to bring his people back to life. And so this wind comes and it causes all of the bones to stand up and it fills them with breath and life and then skin grows over the bones and then all of a sudden Ezekiel sees all of these new humans standing in front of him. Now this vision, it's recalling the story about the creation of humans in Genesis chapter 2, where God made humans out of dirt and divine breath. And so Israel and all humanity have rebelled, resulting in death. And so the only hope is that God would perform a new act of creation and remake humans in such a way that they can truly live in a relationship of love with God and with each other. So as we're looking at the book of Ezekiel, I want to make sure that we're aware of the timeline of where we are in all, the whole of Scripture. So we have Abraham, who's about 1,800 years before Jesus Christ, who was the one that saves us from our sins. He's the one that dies on the cross and raises us from the dead three days later. We're going to be right here at the fall of Jerusalem. But I want to give you a little pattern of how the people of Israel had been functioning for hundreds of years, all the way back to Moses and even before that. They would be a, hear a call from God and they would begin to follow. And then they would get distracted, usually by an idol. In the last week, we used a bobblehead as an example for the idol. The idea that they would bow down and worship. That... You know, the problem with idols, you always have to keep propping them back up so they can save your life. By the way, I borrowed this too, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, Jeremy. He lost his head. The bobble is gone. But they would continually say, I'm going to follow. You mind throwing that to me? That's awesome, bud. Yeah, I owe you a bobblehead. They would follow God, and then they would get distracted by an idol that they thought would save them, and then they would fall away. There would be a warning, and then God would have to come down with a consequence. And as they heard the consequence, they would turn back. One of the specific consequences was that their beloved city, Jerusalem, the jewel of Israel, was lost. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came in and conquered them. And we had a large number of people that were taken into exile. Anyone that had any intelligence or a skill set, they took from Israel and shipped them all the way across the peninsula into Babylon. Three of them that were key characters in this time period are those three of the key characters we're looking at in the, in the major prophets. Ezekiel is one of them, the one we're focused on. Jeremiah and Daniel. They all lived at the same time and their job was to tell the nation of Israel, Knock it off! You're doing something wrong, okay? Turn the other way. You're worshiping idols, and they will do you no good. Specifically, I want you to know a little bit more of the story of Ezekiel. I think if we're going to have someone that's a stranger become a neighbor, you got to know a little bit more about the person, not just the writings. So a little background for you. Uh, Ezekiel was 25 years old when Jerusalem fell and when he was taken into exile. So he's picked up from his home. I want you to picture yourself as a homeowner. 25 years old, he's married and has a wife. We don't know if he has any kids, but he leaves everything he knows. I want you to picture the house that you live in. I want you to picture the roads that you're comfortable with. You got the Umpqua River. Douglas County is home. We have the most beautiful weather. We have the most beautiful trees. This is the most beautiful place. Last week I heard someone tell me that a, a phone call to heaven from here was, was a local call. I, Stop you. Yeah, we love it. Now imagine you are picked up. And you have to walk across the entire desert to land in Babylon where you will be a servant. You have lost everything. Do you feel that now? Five years in, Ezekiel settled there. And some scholars think that the actual moment that this happens is on his 30th birthday. But we know that in his 30th year, he's sitting by the Kaber River. And he's sitting there and he's discouraged. Imagine how you would feel. 
And then God speaks into his life. Now here's the irony of this, and maybe it's just the symmetry of this. But as he's sitting there, turning 30 years old, if he were back in Israel, you know what happens when you're 30 and your name's Ezekiel? He was going to become a priest on that day. And he doesn't get to be a priest because he's on the far side of the world. And there is no temple near them. The tabernacle's not around. His role, doesn't, he doesn't get to play out what he thought his calling would be. And God says, well, I, I got something for you. And there in the first three chapters, God commissions him and gives him an unbelievable vision of what God is going to be doing. He's put in the game. Instead of being a priest working in the temple, he's now a prophet looking at the Israelites and looking at Judah and saying, you're going the wrong way. It wasn't the mission that he thought he had when he was 18 and 23. Here he is at 30 and God says, I got a different mission for you. And he becomes a prophet. Like the way that the, uh, the book breaks down, the first three chapters are this commissioning, this call where he gets to see this vision of what is going to happen to Israel. And I'll tell you, as you're reading those first three chapters, it is a little bit confusing. It's hard because it's not a normal conversation about here's something that's going to happen that you can plainly understand because it's a vision that includes flying things and smoke and extra. The visuals on it are intense. So it's a little bit harder to understand. The next uh, chapters, 4 through 32, are the warnings. Last week we talked about chapter 20, and we looked at how they were headed in a direction and how God was calling them to turn from their ways. Virtually every chapter, and chapters 4 through 32 are all about this, about how bad it's going to be. And if the book ends here, this is just a sad tale. But what I find so often true in my relationship with the Bible is when I think, hey, if the chapter ends here, if the book ends at this moment... It's just a sad tale. But the beauty of it is there are more chapters than 32. In fact, 33 through 48 are all about hope and encouragement and something to look forward to. Now, normally, whenever we are doing a book of the Bible and we come into church, the typical way that Paul and I preach, the typical way that we help you understand the Bible is that you come in, we tell you, turn to chapter 30, this week it's 36. Turn to chapter 36 and we're going to look at that chapter. And we put our eyes into that and we say, what is it that God is saying through this? What does it mean? And then how does it change our lives moving forward? Well, today I want to actually back up and look at this slightly differently. You know, one of the things that will help you understand how to read the Bible is if you look for the repeated phrases. What continues to come up? Because that means there's an emphasis. And you can see this in your home. Imagine if someone in your home says, hey, don't forget that. And it's just mentioned in passing. Is that easy to forget? Yeah. Now, compare that with when it's repeated 18 times. This is really important. It's on your calendar. It's written all over the fridge. It's written on every mirror in Sharpie. Do not forget this. In the same way, when you're reading the Bible, look for what's continually brought up. And so what I want to do is I want to back up for the, the entire book, all 48 chapters, and say, what is the theme throughout? And perhaps it will give us a clear understanding one of the things I do want you to hear, though, first is uh, there's a term that's important here. It's called a metaphor. When you're reading these books, God uses sometimes what it's called the metaphor, the idea that it's not just a very clear, this is what it is. He'll use a descriptor. So, for instance, if I say directly, this is a problem, and then I paint a picture of it with, imagine you're at the hospital and I tell a story that goes with it. Oftentimes, you will see this within the book of Ezekiel. So, uh, case in point, the first part of chapter 36, there's a prophecy for the mountains of Israel. I read that and thought, mountains don't even care. It talks about the enemies of the mountains of Israel. Who is blowing up mountains in Israel? What are you talking about? And then I realized it's a metaphor to help you understand what's going to happen to the people of Israel. So when you look at this and you see something that seems to, to be varied and you're like, I don't know that I follow this, keep moving. It's probably a metaphor. Okay? So as we back up and look at the whole of the scripture, including these metaphors, I want to say, what is it that in the book of Ezekiel, what does it reveal about the character of God? One of the things I think we don't spend enough time noticing is that the book of the Bible, every book of the Bible, and the, the Bible itself, there is one central character. His name is God. And our job is to help understand how can we understand who he is and paint a picture of who he is. In fact, if you continually, while reading your Bible, ask this simple question, who is God? It will bring greater clarity to you than anything else that you will do. Because as your view of him changes, it allows you to have your view of yourself and others change. In fact, we often say this, that the horizontal 
how we relate to people, rests on the vertical, how we relate to him. And when your picture of him changes, it changes everything. So one of the things that I notice in the entire book of Ezekiel, not just in one specific chapter, is number one is that God wants to be known. Repeated 84 times in the book, something to the effect of, then you will know that I am God. Then you will know it is me that saves. Then you will know, then you will know. God wants to be known. Here's an interesting thought about that. This is, <laughs> this is the creator of the universe. And he cares so much about a little tiny people called Israel that is now in exile to let them know. He sends a prophet, Ezekiel. He sends another one, Daniel. And he sends another one, Jeremiah, to tell them this key information. I want you to know me. We have no right to demand that God would share himself with us. But he has this deep desire to say, you, sitting in Sutherland, you in Myrtle Creek or in Green, all of you, I want you to know who I am. This book was written 2,700 years ago, and yet the same principle is still true today. God wants you to know him. The second phrase that I see in this that's repeated over and over and over again is that God wants to be heard. At the end of so many paragraphs, he's saying something. Sometimes it's gracious and hopeful, and sometimes it is harsh and tough, and it is tough love. And he says, I, the Lord, have spoken. Forty-five times in 48 chapters, he says, I'm the one speaking to you. And again, this is the creator of the universe, and he cares so much about us. So much about Israel that he says, I want you to know that I'm speaking to you. And we don't deserve it. And yet he graciously gives it. I, I want to put one more in here. And it's specifically from chapter 36. As I was reading 36, a chapter of hope, a chapter for the future. I noticed there was a certain phrase repeated. And as I was asking this question, who is God? What do I need to know more? What, what visual can I have greater clarity on in understanding who he is? Something came up, and what we're going to do is, as I read the text, I want you to be looking for the answer to this question, who is God? Now, I'm going to be reading from the CEV, which is the Contemporary English Version uh, Translation. When you're reading a tough book, can I give you a piece of advice? Use a lot of different translations. We normally use the NIV. This week, I want to use a different one because the wording brings some clarity for me. Uh, translations are basically taking the same Hebrew text and when they put it in English, they use different words, basically synonyms, that allow some people to say, oh, that makes more sense to me. So I'm going to be reading from the CEV, and you are looking for what question? Who is God? Because he's our central character. So we're going to pick this up in uh, verse 18. And he's talking about the people of Israel. Listen to what he says there. They committed murders and worshipped idols, which made the land even worse. So in my anger, I punished my people. And scattered them throughout all the nations, just as they deserved. Wherever they went, my name was disgraced because of foreign, the foreigners insulted my people by saying, I had forced them out of their own land. I care what these foreign, those foreigners think of me. In 22, he goes on, so tell the Israelites that I am saying, you have disgraced my holy name among the nations where you now live. So you don't deserve what I'm going to do for you. I will lead you home to bring honor to my name. My name. What's the story about? God. And to show foreign nations that I am holy. Then they will know that I am the Lord God. Remember what was the first context? 84 times in this book it brings it up. Then you will know. Then they will know. Even within this one. He wants to be known even by people outside of Israel. I have spoken. Point number two. God wants to be heard. But look at the third one. And I don't know if you caught it. But in the midst of all of that, he was talking mostly about the, key, the central character of the Bible. He was talking about himself. Because I believe this, that God wants to be honored. Let me show you again where we see this. My name was disgraced. And that's a big deal. You know, like if, if you say, if the name Will Irwin was disgraced, you would say, yeah, he probably did something stupid. God Almighty has never done anything wrong. And when his name is disgraced, there is a problem. Because there is a vast difference, a, a vast difference between me and my frailties and in my foolishness and God's perfection. He is the only one who deserves perfect honor and he, des, and he demands it. My name was disgraced. It says in verse 21, and I care what those foreigners think of me. 
It also says in verse 23, to show four nations that I am holy. He has an intent here. He's trying to get the point across. There is a reason why I'm doing what I do. And if I could dial back on this, remember, who is God? And as I'm looking for that, when you begin to paint a clear picture on who he is, you will see him differently. One of the things the Bible says about God is that God is a father. Now here's the problem for many of us. When we were raised by a foolish father, or if we had a father that did not live up to the standard of God, which would be every one of our fathers, there has to be some recalibrating on that. Because if, if your father didn't want to be known, if, if he came home, and if, depending on your generation, if he came home, and when he got home, he read the paper and he ignored you, or now when he gets home, he just looks at his tablet and goes like this the whole time, and you talk to him, and he says, not now, not now. If your dad doesn't want to be known, it's hard to comprehend a father, the good, good father, the father to the fatherless. It's hard to imagine that he wants to be known. And if the only time your father says, I have spoken, is when you were in trouble, and there was no connectivity between you and him, and his words were only to be heard when he was angry, then you don't understand the God that we're looking at here. Because he's a different kind of father than most of us were raised with. And when it comes to honor, here's the massive difference. Remember the idea of me being honored? Foolish, selfish will versus holy, perfect God. He is the one that deserves honor. And if a father was, un, was dishonorable and then demanded honor, it's really hard to follow that. Conversely, let me just pull that back for a second. If you're a dad... How you act is a really big deal because your relationship to your kids is the first understanding they're going to have of who God is. Now, granted, you will never get it all right, and they will have to be retrained on who God is. But let me tell you, when you are disconnected, when the only time you want to be heard is when you are angry, and when you do not live an honorable life, the impacts are devastating to your kids because you are painting a picture now. And this is true when your kid is six. It is true when your kid is 16. It is true when your kid is 36. It is true when he's 56. I don't care where you are in your span of the journey. If you are a father, how you relate to your kids is impacting their view of God. There's a secondary part that I want us to look at, especially from chapter 36. It's really the heartbeat of what we're, at, we're doing here at Family Church. One of the highest values we have here is transformation. That who I am in 2019 is not who I will be in 2020 because God is transforming my life. That as I see God differently, as he transforms me, change happens. So I want to ask a simple question. How do I do that? How does change come to me? Now as I go back into the text and we start looking at chapter 36 again, I'm going to ask you to look for something. Look for what's repeated so as he picked this up, we're going to be in, in verse 24. He's talking specifically to Israel now. And as he's talking to Israel, he is bringing them back around to this idea. Remember, they have been taken from their home and placed somewhere else. There is a lot of heartbreak that's gone on in the last two generations. And this is what he says. I will gather you from the foreign nations and bring you home. Pause for a second and imagine yourself not in Douglas County. You've been ripped from your home. You've been ripped from your friends and you are somewhere else. And I will sprinkle you with clean water and you will be clean and acceptable to me. I will wash away everything that makes you unclean and I will remove your disgusting idols. I will take away your stubborn heart and give you a new heart and a desire to be faithful. The NIV says I will take away your heart of stone and I will replace it with a heart of flesh and a desire to be faithful, you will have only pure thoughts because I will put my spirit in you and make you eager to obey my laws and teachings. It goes on in 29. I will protect you from anything that makes you unclean. Your fields will overflow with grain and no one will starve. Your trees will be filled with fruit and crops will grow in your fields so that you will never again feel ashamed for not having enough food. Now listen carefully to this, these two uh, verses here. You will remember your evil ways and hate yourselves for what you have done. People of Israel, I'm not doing these things for your sake. You sinned against me and you must suffer shame and disgrace for what you have done. I, the Lord God, have spoken. Now as we were reading that, did you see some repeated phrases? 
One specific one stood out to me. In fact, it didn't stand out to me. I was talking about it with my staff and read it out loud, and, and one of them said, I will. I went, oh, let me write that down. I will. I didn't even notice that. You know what? As it played out, think about this. Everything that was just spoken, it was God saying, I will this. I will bring you home. I will clean you. I will do it. I will. I will. Do you know why? Because God is the central character of this story. And the myth is that the person receiving the info, Israel, that this is about them. (laughs) This isn't about them. In fact, he says, you don't even deserve what I'm going to do. And I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for the sake of my honorable name. It's not about you. In fact, on your outline where it says, how do I change? I want you to write the words, I will. Because this is the story of God doing something amazing. One of the things that I noticed, beginning in verse, verse 22 is that one of the things that I have to have for for change is that I have to see it through grace. I need grace in this. Quick definition of grace is getting what I don't deserve. And look at what it says right here in verse 22. So tell the Israelites that I am saying, you have disgraced my holy name among the nations where you now live. So you don't deserve, don't deserve, by definition, that's grace, what I am going to do for you. You know, there's a common and deadly misconception on what grace is in America. We have come to an understanding or a belief, not an understanding, that grace is actually deserved. For instance, play this out. You just finished the sentence for me. Everyone deserves a second. What happened to your first one? You screwed it up. That's what happened to it, okay? (laughs) You don't deserve a second chance. If you do deserve second chances, don't call it grace. Because grace is getting what you don't deserve. You see the problem here. Case in point, saw this in my life. As a fifth grader, I, I got suspended from school. And now I'm preaching to you. <laughs> yeah, it happens. Anyway, uh, fifth grade, as Mrs. Mitchell was walking me down to the principal's office, there was a holy terror in my heart because of what I had done. And as I got to the principal's office, I stood before Mr. Rice and he looked at me. And in a pretty gracious way, I think, he said, did you do it? You know what I said? Nothing! I just sat there and cried. <laughs> and I just melted in a pool of tears. And then he called my father. Now back then, we didn't have uh, school buses that stopped every third house. I actually had to walk home. It wasn't snowing, I'm not going to lie. But when the school was out, I had sat in in Mr. Rice's office the rest of the day. This was at lunchtime, the rest of the day. And then I had to walk home. It was a Friday, which was horrible because my suspension I had to worry about all weekend long. And as I got home, we lived in a trailer that was owned by the church where my dad was the pastor. And he was in the office across the parking lot. And I picked up the phone. It used to have cords. I don't know if you remember. They were cords. And I had to dial, and I dialed. You only had to punch in seven numbers back then, too. And I dialed, and it rang. And then my dad answered the phone, and I said, Dad, I'm home. And I know the words that he said was, I'll be right over. Do you know what I heard? I'm on my way. You're going to pay for this. (laughs) That's what I heard. And so, you remember the tears with Mr. Rice, that kind of happened again, and my dad got there. And typically in my home, uh, in, my, in my parents' home, when you made a mistake at school, when you sinned at school, there were consequences at school. And there were consequences when you got home as well. And I got home, and my dad saw my tears, and he saw how much, and he just saw this blubbering mess, and my dad was gracious. And you know what consequence I got at home? Nothing. I got grace instead. About three, four, six weeks, sometime later that same year, I got a detention. Now, relax, all right? Come on. The suspension is up here. You're sent home or you have to sit in an office all day long. Suspension's not good. Detention, eh, it's, not a, it's not a good thing. You have to go and you lose a recess and you have to get something signed by your parents so they know. And here's what happened. When I gave, brought home my detention, I said, hey, I got a detention. And my parents said, mm. And then they gave me a consequence. And I had the wisdom to say, hey, how come I didn't get any consequence for a suspension, but for detention, I'm getting in trouble? That didn't go well. (laughs) You see, here's the, the line of thinking that I had. I deserve grace. Well, that's no longer grace. That's just the new standard. It's just a new lower standard. 
But I want you to understand something. Grace is not something you deserve. And the reason we miss it is because we think we are the central character in the story and we're not. God is the center of this story. Look at the story again. So tell the Israelites that I'm saying, you have disgraced my holy name. Who is the main character in this verse? It is not me. It is not you. It is not Israel. It's God. And if the mindset is this is about me and whether or not I get the consequence, whether or not I get off, is not the point. This is about who God is. So you remember going back, who is God? This is why it transforms everything in the way that I live. When my view of him changes, all of this changes. Because if I'm an entitled brat who deserves for God to forgive me, and you better forgive me too, no matter how much of a jerk I am, you will not see transformation in me until you realize, until I realize that the central character of the Bible and the central character in my life is God. God is the center of this story. Look at the second one. It's going to have the same point to it. The second thing that I see in this is that the desperate need for the Holy Spirit. It's very, very interesting here. He says to them, I will put my spirit in you. Remember that idea that there was a heart of stone replaced with a heart of flesh? There was, an, there was a stubborn heart that's replaced with a different kind of heart? That entire principle comes when he says, and I will put my spirit in you. We need to back up and give you a little context of how the Holy Spirit worked in the Old Testament. So I'm going to give you a little, um, hopefully a clearer understanding. In the Old Testament, that's before Jesus Christ had come to earth and died on the cross and risen again. In the Old Testament, when he was talking to Israel, the Holy Spirit came very rarely. It usually came on an individual for, for a specific time for a specific reason. Which means the Holy Spirit was just not indwelling all of them. They went to a place to meet with God. First the tabernacle and then the temple. It wasn't until Jesus Christ died and rose again and then came back and talked with his disciples and he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And here's what's interesting. He's saying you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. But in all contexts that we see in the Old Testament, that wasn't for them. Here's an interesting little thought here, and you have to play this all the way out. The Holy Spirit that he talks about here, he's actually speaking about 600 years later when Jesus Christ has come back from the dead and the Holy Spirit is given to all. Here's the crazy thing about this. This verse was written 2,700 years ago. It wasn't written to Sutherland and Myrtle Creek and Green. It was written to Israel, and yet this prophecy was actually written to the church, which means it actually is more relevant for you than for Israel. Play that all the way out. When God spoke through Elijah, he was speaking about a Holy Spirit that would come. And here's the, what, the transformative thing. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ and you've said you're in charge of my life, he puts the Holy Spirit in you. And it be, if you want to talk about changing you, this is where that really happens. Because as the Holy Spirit comes in, you will hear him ask you to do things. And you're like, that's crazy. I ain't doing that. In fact, here's how I know it's the Holy Spirit. When the nature of how I want to do it it's not what this, the voice in my head says. When I say, yeah, buy eight cups of coffee and spend that money on coffee, and God says, I want you to give it to that person. I'm like, that's the dumbest thing ever. I'm way more happy when I have coffee. Aren't you with me? That's a much better use of, of money is to spend it on me. Or when you have the, the, the moment where you're like, I will never forgive, and the Holy Spirit says, you need to let that go. No, I'm not. I, do you remember what they did? I'm not doing it. And when the Holy Spirit says, and it's often that whisper, mm, mm, I think you should go this way. And it's counter to what I want. I know that's probably the Holy Spirit working in me. And this is what you learn to listen for. What does the Bible say? And then what is the Holy Spirit saying? And when they line up, that's what you follow. And when it's what I want, and then here's the other thing, that just a little piece of advice. If you'd like to really ignore the Holy Spirit, just keep ignoring him. Because he'll stop talking. When you're unwilling to hear, just, just ignore him and you'll be fine. No, you actually won't. But you think you'll be fine because you'll actually get to do what you want to do. And it will end probably with you moving your heart off of his. But if you learn to listen, it will change the way that you see God. It will change the way that you hear from God. It will change this perspective. And it will change all of the other relationships that you have as well. But notice this. Who's the central character in changing our lives? It's the Holy Spirit. It's God. Who is the central character of this story? God. It is God and God alone. There's another aspect of transformation or change that I see in this. And it's the need for conviction. Specifically, he has one of the most, one of the harshest verses 
that I think you'll see. Listen to what he says in verse 31. You will remember your evil ways and hate yourself for what you've done. You know why he's saying this so harshly? Because it's exactly what they need. You see, in the underlying current of this, remember this was written 2,700 years ago, and it wasn't written to us. It was written to Israel. But it was written for us because there is a universal principle that goes beyond just the context of them and comes to us. Here's what it is. Sin is a really big deal. Sin will destroy your life. Sin will destroy the lives of your family members. Sin will destroy your spouse. Sin will destroy your future. Sin is a really big deal. And this is a group of people that has not been listening. And he says to them, you will remember your evil ways and you will hate yourselves for what you've done. Underlying principle. Sin is a really big deal. But here's the problem, and I want to speak to two groups in here. There are some of you that you have made this your life verse. And for the last 40 years, because of what you've done, you've been beating yourself up for this. But I want to tell you how this principle of sin is a really big deal, how it translates into the New Testament. Because there's a massive change that happens. See, Jesus Christ came and lived the perfect life and then died for our sins and rose three days later. Sin is a big deal. Such a big deal that God sent Jesus to die because of it. See, there's sin that's a big deal and his love that's a big deal. And here's how this is different for you than it was for Israel. If you've accepted Jesus, sin's big deal has been put on Jesus. So listen to this, especially for those of you who have been beating yourself up for what you did. And you can't, you would be so heartbroken and ashamed if you had to come up here and tell people what you've done. But you've been hiding in shame for a long time and you've been beating yourself up. Let me tell you what Romans 8 says, because of Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 1 says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So I'd like to talk to, to two groups in the room. For some of you, you're blowing off sin. And I'd actually like to put on the dad voice and, and, and come strong at this. Sin is a big deal, and what you are doing is destroying your life, it's destroying your spouse, it's destroying your relationships, and the direction you are headed leads to death. And it costs you everything, and you are blowing it off because you think, well, I have Jesus, so I'll just do what I want and get away with it. And I want you to know something. Sin is a big deal. Sin never destroys just the person who sins. It also affects everyone in your sphere, and you are killing the people around you. And here's your option. John Calvin said this, you can kill your sin, or your sin will be killing you. And those are the only options. And for those of you who are just saying, eh, I'll do what I want. I gave you caution. Sin is a big deal. I also like to talk to those of you who are beating yourself up. And perhaps today is a day where you find some freedom. Sin's a big deal. Such a big deal that Jesus Christ died for you. And when he gave his life for you, he took all of that on himself. And you need to know this. You don't need to beat yourself up anymore. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus we got a couple challenges that I want to give you. But first, I'm going to release to the South Elm Quantum Green. I love you guys, and we'll see you soon. The two challenges I want you to walk away with today is I want you to really evaluate two areas of your life. Number one is are you listening to the Holy Spirit? When the Holy Spirit is guiding, when he is speaking, when he is drawing, are you listening? The second challenge is where is the Holy Spirit convicting you? Where is it that you're blowing off sin, moving it to the side, and missing out on grace because you're unwilling to admit your desperate need for it? Let me pray for us. God, I thank you that this story is about you and not about me, that this is not about Israel, that this is not about Ezekiel. This is about an all-powerful God who is not only all-powerful, he is so loving. Thank you for grace, thank you for the Holy Spirit, and thank you for conviction, which begins and ends with you. God, I pray that you would align me with you, that you would take me away from me and put me on you. God, I pray for those who are struggling with the idea of listening. God, I pray for those people who are struggling with conviction, that you would move them towards the peace that comes with surrendering and saying, yes, I am a sinner and needing the change. And Lord, I also pray uh, for those who in the room right now 
have been beating themselves up for years. I pray that they would live with no condemnation. In your name we pray. Amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.